can submit it to IMDb, you can put credits on your video. Everyone's walking around with a whole studio. Seven on their days phones, of the week. I got ways we can eat. Counting ways on the beach. Learning names we can meet. I'm booked. I'm booked. I'm booked. I'm booked. I'm booked. Send a text to my phone. Saying, can you are you home? Need you to work the show. Need words that glow. I'm booked. I'm booked. I'm booked. I'm booked. I'm booked. Seven days a week. I got ways we can meet. Counting ways on the beach. Counting ways. We cannot compare. Black Panther. Yeah, well. DC's. Dark. I better. Oh, wow. But you have to be able to look at it in the long scope. I know there's a lot of Marvel fans. They're looking at it. <laughs> most, most, no people, line. most people are looking, you know, within like a 10 year window, but if you look at the, the history of uh, DC, starting with the best superhero ever, uh, and I know people are wondering, who's that? I know, because DC has so many, they're all great. Batman, Superman, which of those two is actually the best? That depends. They're both Superman great. is trash. No matter how you look at okay. it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's. There's no risk. You know he's going to survive. He can turn back time. I understand, no I understand the idea no of that. But, you know, but he dies. He dies in the comic. Is this on right now? Oh, this is live. That's true. Oh, this is live. Let's get back. Oh, wow. Back so then y'all know. Where's the camera? Is it right there? Yeah. Then y'all know what I'm talking about. Hopefully, you can hear me better than her because I have a mic <laughs> that way. Because I use the mic kind of to amplify. <laughs> I think the truth, you know? <laughs> and so I pass it when I think other people are ready to contribute to the construction of that truth, but it's a lot harder than it's you think. DC. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a villainous, I'm a villain. I'm just joking. I'm not a villain, most likely. Can you be a dope ass man? I like playing villains. If I ever get to do any acting, I like to play villains. Okay, so let's. I just want to sum up some of you guys, sum yourselves up for this, uh, for this thing. Actually, we don't even need to do that. I kind of want to just go right into um, some stuff. Where, what do you, where do you think write, like writing is heading? We see stuff like Marvel and DC. That's kind of an interesting, um, what you call it. Uh, insight into where we're going to be headed for the future of film. Where do you think film is headed? You do a lot of work in media. I mean, that's like your main yeah. thing. So, like, yeah. what 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 do you anticipate you you to be doing that yeah. you'll be doing in another five to ten years? I think the the film industry in general with media mm -hmm. is extremely powerful. Yeah. In our culture, in society in general. Uh, the writing has become much more, I don't know if you've been able to like pick it out or notice, but the writing has become much more raw. Mm -hmm. People are telling the truth much more than just a good story. They're finding that, oh, the truth is a good story. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more, you know, documentary, a lot more based off of a true story. But, you know, even mm -hmm. fictional, you know, characters or fictional movies or stories instead of making it grand and fantastical and oh everything is great every a lot of script writers and screenwriters they are just telling the truth and that is what is causing a lot more in my opinion and what with what i have seen with madhouse domain telling the truth brings much more impact inspiration even entertainment than you know what we can just pull from our our hats is Creatives. Yeah. Uh, that's 100% correct. I mean, um, when I took marketing in at Full Sail, you know, one thing about advertising and marketing is the story. 
you know, when you start seeing like Nike commercials where they're like tugging on the heartstring, like the single mother who's doing this for her child and then the child grows up to be like an athletic star and everything like that, like people can really relate to that, mm -hmm. you know, and things like Black Panther, what I really liked about that was the fact that they tied in such a relatable like plot line because you had as far as when you're even here in the United States, when you're someone who is educated mm -hmm. or someone who quote unquote leaves the ghetto or things like that, you automatically have this particular perception because a lot of us are need healing. And we don't we for so long have been taught to go against each other and even when we were trying to band together it's all like, you know, here comes a grenade and you know, military bombing and that's some shit. But, you know, we're able to, you know, learn from that and be able to weave the type of story that we see in something like Black Panther where you have almost like this African versus African American narrative because here, you know, we that's something that was unless it was taught to you or you had that particular want to even learn more, you didn't know that amazing stuff. Like it would seem like Wakanda when you find out like the amazing history that's there in Africa. You know, it's mind blowing. You know, when you look at the, you hear about the first castles that are there, that were made there and you hear about these crazy cities in the time where there were mud huts. Like, you know, you're able to see the carbon, um, whatever, carbon dated, and see, be able to see, like, oh, this happened, like, almost 100 years apart. You know, so that type of information and knowledge when it comes to what's deep within us, like our genetics, I think that, you know, we have an obligation you know, to storytell, and that's why, you know, people say whatever as far as like, oh, Marvel's, you know, by, you know, rest in peace, you know, white guy and things like that, but we forget who had creative control over that to be able to connect with so many people that, you know, are here in America that are able to be like, you know, it seems like a fairy tale. You know, that's why, even though a lot of people didn't agree <laughs> with, you know, um, Killmonger, they understood deeply yeah. that reasoning behind that. That's interesting. So, given that, that's where we are right now. Where do you think writing is going? If I may ask. <laughs> well, why don't you ask her? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, we're getting a little saucy. <laughs> we're getting upset with each other. I didn't know this was going to be a brawl. Uh, well, I think, you want to know what I think? I think this is where writing's at. No, I'm sure. Um, all right, if I had to guess, I, I think that, uh, I think poetry, for one, is going to have a resurgence because I think it's the, one of the most authentic kinds of writing. Um, and I agree with what Lauren said, too. I do think that we are going towards uh, more realism. Um, I think writing, I wonder, you know, because art changes all the time, like with music, you know, you have um, at the time, you know, jazz or like the drummers were everything, right? And then, um, you know, now we're sort of at a time where I think sound engineers are getting more and more popular, you know, and people are known for being producers and certain things, you know, it used to be musicians weren't really that known, it was all about the singer. So I feel like different things can be highlighted at different times. I feel like writing is kind of falling into a place where it's becoming somewhat unidentifiable in some genres, like reality TV. So there's like writers there, there's people who understand stories, story crafters, and I think they probably get credited as writers. I don't know how they get credited on, on reality. They have writers, yeah, you see writers, that's why it's like, no, this is reality TV, and then you see a bunch of writers. So I think um, his writing gets ambiguous like that, and there's a lot of people whose job it is just to create storylines. I think um, more and more writers will probably go into producer-type roles. Um, I don't know what media's going to look like. I feel like there's going to be a lot more 
a lot, lot more people just watching vlogs. Um, I, I think so. I, I don't know, and more real stuff. And then there'll be documentaries, and so those will have producers, and and and, and those people will help craft storylines. Um, I also think there's a lot of room for writers, maybe somewhere. This is me just going in on it now. Like in the future, future, I think there's a lot of room for writers in science, in different kinds of science, like because they need a lot of creative help, and there's going to be so much going on. Like I think we need so many more coders, which we're like bumping that up, right? So we're 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 increasing coders. And what about coders? Are coders writers? You know, to what extent is someone who writes, you know, a piece of after the language, the language of computer writing is more streamlined. Someone who writes. Um, an experience that's better than someone else, to what degree are they a writer? I don't know. So, in general, I'm just throwing out random ideas. I think writing in the future is going to be, I think, I think poetry is going to come back. It's going to be, it didn't go anywhere. A lot of people are reading poetry, but I think the attention is going to shift more and more to it. I saw um, this one poet on Jimmy Fallon. I was like, that's pretty cool. Uh, that was like the first poet, Ruby Kaur. She wrote Milk and Honey. You know, everyone's loving that book. So they're good books of poetry. And anyway, out there. But um, she's she's really great right now. I'm not a hater. I'm not a hater. She's doing really great right now. And to have like a poet go out and Jimmy Fallon, you know, like you didn't think that was gonna happen after like Maya Angelou. So I think there's gonna be more room for that, um, especially when we really think about what that role is for being a poet. I think that's what's a little bit confusing right now because it's like uh, the the awards and everything they don't really stack up. Like uh, there's probably a Pulitzer Prize for poetry. I'm assuming there's a Grammy for a spoken word album. So there's a lot of celebration around some of the apparatus of like music and and TV. And there's so many people who work on these projects now. They're so collaborative that I think celebrating them contribute. There's more to celebrate there because there's more money being generated in those fields, so you can spend more money on the celebrations, which means that you know you can uh, include and then, well, which means that you have a higher level of production value before you even start spending money on production, and then there's so much attention already in those fields. So I don't know how that's going to end up happening with poetry. I feel like a lot of that stuff is going to be taken away by social media. Um, yeah, because I mean, with with media production costs are so low now that I think, uh, and then awards. What do you really need an award show for when everyone can tell you what they think about everything? You would almost just want to see, like, I don't know, maybe like stats polls. I think there could be like some kind of website that really aggregates polls in a certain kind of way, in like that you won't really need a Grammys. Um, because I don't really know what the Grammys offer. No one believes in their judgments in general. Like, and it's not really even set up to judge music. It's been set up. It's the, what is it? The, the name of the place. It's set up to give awards to sound engineers, essentially. Well, it's set, the, the voting is done by music industry people, and it's a sound engineer academy that did it, you know, because they make a lot of money from it. So I don't know. So when it comes to picking the, the musicians, I don't think they do a lot there. And then there's performances, so Coachella could just start filming itself. And that would be more interesting than the Grammys, in my opinion. Um, so what do you guys think about, well, let's switch topics. Other topic, we'll jump back and forth between writing in the future and um, self-publishing and how the decentralization of media, because we can all self-publish now, we can self-publish video. You don't need anything. You can make your own video, you can put it up there, you can submit it to IMDb. You can put credits on your video. Everyone's walking around with a whole studio on their phones, if not their laptops. So it's more media companies than ever. And then in writing, self-publishing is also really cool. Um, first, I guess, what do, you, what do you guys think of publishing? What do you think of publishing, the power of it? Why do you think publishing is important? So I think publishing is important as far as the fact that you you write 
and you want people to, to get, you know, so it's just all like, I think the idea of publishing with social media has turned into this thing where literally when you post something online, you're a publisher, you know, and it's time stamped. And I think that we're, you know, Gary Vee speaks about it a lot, how we're at a very interesting time with the internet where it's just maybe in its, I don't know, teenage years, early, you know, 20 years. So it's just all like when I think about that time with me, I'm just all like, okay, it definitely wasn't 100% responsible. Like there wasn't, there's still a lot more to learn, you know, when it comes to the internet and publishing. And so I think that, you know, um, publishing is pretty much just bringing your ideas to the surface. And I think that it's going to become I don't necessarily think that there's going to be more publishing houses. I think that there's going to be more of a way to um, put a price tag on the fact that we can literally post whenever, you know? Um, so that's pretty much what I think publishing is. Um, yeah, I echo a lot of your thoughts as well. I think self-publishing is actually wonderful. Mm -hmm. I think it's beautiful. A lot of writers or artists in general, I mean, they'd go their entire lives not being allowed the opportunity to have a platform to share their thoughts with an audience that exists outside of their own personal you know, realm. And so I do, I think that self-publishing and publishing is, is a wonderful tool to be able to express and share you know, the ideas that you have as an artist um, I think it's a great way also to stay, you know, connected with one another. You know, there's a ton, like with self-publishing, you know, that's everywhere. And you're able to, instead of just having to go to, you know, a bookstore and see somebody on a shelf and how hard it is to get a spot on that shelf, I, you know, you, Amazon, you know, you just look online and you can just go to, you know, an app on your phone and see amazing pieces that were done by Joe down the street. And, and I, so I think that's, that's valuable and I think that that will allow uh, you know, more people to be able to get in, get in the game. You know, that's necessary in this time. Yeah, before I give it back, um, what you were saying before as far as writing in the future, I think that where we're at right now, writers are needed. You know, and I think that it's going to be at a point where they're almost considered like a doctor when it comes to healing, mm -hmm. you know, because when you're writing in all different forms, you know, you, you're able to, I think, you know, we're all authors in different ways, you know, the same way, like, there would be a, a, a rapper that goes off the head and doesn't write any of his stuff, you know, you can think about your everyday life as your freestyling, your life, you know, without having to write it down. And I think that when we start seeing in marketing and movies and um, video games and like you're saying coding, like that's very interesting because even coding is, you know, they, they a lot of coders speak of it being a language, you know, and what do we do a language? We write, you know, and so there's going to be I feel like writing, um, writers are needed. Like, there's been several times where inspiration would like literally wake me out of bed. And that type of, you know, need, and to be able to put that out, even though I wrote it for myself or wrote something that happened to me, the fact that I can write a book, self-publish it, and even though it was regarded that even though it was something that I wrote for me people can read it and be like man like get out of my head like that's what I was thinking you know and that to me is amazing that to me is God that to me is like the way of you know looking these these writers for so long were just like painters you know and didn't get paid for their work and you know um, and now we're in a day and age where you can self-publish something, you can make money off of it, and that in itself, I think mm -hmm. writers are just gonna be needed more, you know, because it it's healing, 
you're literally healing. You know, whether it's something simple, like I think about the alchemist, and I'm just all like, it's healing. It's a fiction book, but it was able to capture the anxiety and the want to pursue something that seemed impossible, you know? And that's what a lot of our dreams can feel like with society. And the more writers that are able to do the impossible, I think that that's going to cause more people to become authors and just write. Like when you look at the history of Timbuktu mm -hmm. and the leather bound, you know, books that our ancestors wrote, a lot of them were stuff like how to please your wife, how to take care of your kids. Like these were like books to help you, you know, we were on that way back then, you know, so I think that's going to end up circling back around where that's more needed. I love it. Uh, you know, I feel like it must have been something you said, Lauren, that kind of brought that up. Because I was thinking the exact same thing, and when you wanted to talk, I was like, I, I knew you were going to touch on it, because that always happens. I'm like, all right, cool, he'll say it, and then I'll be able to keep thinking about it, because that's what I really want to do. And I think there is um, so much, and I wish, I'm gonna, when I watch it back, I'm going to examine what you said that inspired us both to, both to think in this path. Because I was thinking, you know, like writing, especially positive writing, there's so much work for people. Um, to be done. I think any kind of writing, even if you're not like really doing a good job and you're talking about a lot of negative stuff, I think just the act of coalescing your thoughts creates more um, creation, intelligent creation out there for us to continue building civilization off of, you know, and it'll exist to whatever degree that it needs to exist, um, which might just be, it was, it was for you to spend your time on it. Um, but I think that when it gets into what, what makes really good writing, because I was like, what do I like out of really good shows, you know? And they really do level me up. I almost think about it all the time, it's like, it's like additional, if it's a really cool idea or a really cool emotion that they're codifying into like a certain thing so that it hits me, whatever they're doing, I feel like it's a level up for me. Like, I've gone to a new place. I have this new way of thinking. It's going to change. I have that imagery to use in my own writing, and then I also have those prototypes, those templates to like play out in my day, if it's um, good writing. Like, so I think um, there's a lot of room for writers to, as you said, heal diff a variety of sicknesses in society. And I think that's why I love being in media, is because you get to create situations uh, for people to um, meditate on something and take away something which will help impact their life and a, and a lot of people are in in okay I can especially right now if you're in America there's so many things you can do to dramatically change the quality of your life and the abundance of your resources there's so many things to do and it can be really confusing and then you know the hardest part of that is when you venture into some of these unknown places, your ego and your imagination can take control and kind of send you spiraling a little bit. And I think media is a lot of what people latch onto in order to keep themselves um, sane. And I think the quality of media allows you to do it better. That's why I watch certain stuff. Um, is because I think that either it's just, I like the ideals enough to where it doesn't disturb me and I can just enjoy it like as a fantasy, or I feel like I'm learning something to transform my ego. Like I can, I, I can get to the place of humility really fast if I watch a certain thing. I can get to deep meditation. That's why I like dramas and why I like you know indie music like Fleet Foxes type things because it gets me in a place of deep meditation. And I think my poetry feeds off of that, and then I write. You know, I put a lot of weird imagery into it, and I have all these like pastoral. Um, you know, like just ideas in my head about beauty and like uh, a strong man <laughs> heading towards destiny, loving those around. You know, these narratives that we create, I think watching stuff with that kind of stuff, it helps us jump into that zone super fast. Well, I, yeah, if I could just put it, like tag a little bit of what you're saying, because yeah. we're talking about it's the power of writers, where as writers we're able to heal others, but I just wanted to back up, make a s small little comment. Mm -hmm. Writing is healing mm -hmm. to the writer yeah. themselves. So, you know, even though we are yeah. healing others through mm -hmm. our writing, 
when you are writing, when yeah. you are creating, yeah. there is an audience of one that needs the process of what you are doing. And that is sometimes, many times, even yourself. Because a lot of times, as artists in general, you know, we crave an audience. We do. We work well in front of audiences. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but for healing's sake, mm -hmm. that audience is an audience of one. Mm. Because just by yourself, I know personally, I have written things years ago, and mm. I will forget that it even existed, but I will stumble upon it, and I, I will read it, and it will bring me healing. It will bring me revelation about myself or about my past seasons. You know, there's definitely been times even where, you know, I'm up against oppression, and I will read something back then and see where I've come from, and it will put me in a place of thankfulness. It will put me in a place of remembering, hey, I'm not alone here. Okay, you know, we're doing all right. So the power that we have as writers to heal uh, and impact others is fantastic, phenomenal, but it cannot be replaced with the power of being able to even heal yourself mm -hmm. in that process. So I just wanted to put that out there. I mean, you had something? Oh, yeah. Uh, no, that's 100% true because I look at some of my songs from 10, 12 years ago and I'm just like, did I write this for my future self? Yes, because, you prophetic. know, it's like, you know, that's something that I felt but I didn't understand. And I just wrote it and I was like, all right, this is what I'm feeling, but it didn't hit me personally until later on down the line. And I'm just like, oh, that's wild. And I think that why I say writers are going to be important is because we're healing ourselves in a way that if we don't write, we're depressed. If we don't create, we're depressed. We literally have no choice or we're going to be depressed. And I think that, you know, the we're, we're going to be like self-medicated healers pretty much. Yeah. Like there, we're literally, I think that it's getting to a point where, you know, that is like going to the doctor, you know, that is like a checkup because there's an energy that goes into it that you automatically, whether it's writing it down, you're getting it out of you. It's almost like getting a sickness out of you, you know, and when it gets on the page, it happens to turn into a garden, you know, like just for the mere fact that, you know, I imagine, you know, if God touches something or something of that magnitude will be able to touch it and turn it into a garden and be able to turn something that's destitute and desert into an oasis, you know, just by getting it out of you. I love that. Super cool. Only thing I wanted to add to it was that I, I love that healing is, not even add, but I also think I'm thinking about healing as just a, as an organized, like a, um, a way of organizing things back to the way that they were supposed to be, you know, like, what's going on with your body? Honestly, you know, let's say you have a tumor, the tumor's like, this is pretty awesome. He's like, this is the best I've ever lived. You know, he doesn't really care that the person's not, it's not funny at all, I guess, but I can't believe you guys laughed. That was pretty dark. Oh, but, uh, <laughs> ECC, she said she was breathing. <laughs> but no, like, so that thing is living, but I think, <laughs> healing, you know, is like reorganizing it in a way where um, reorganizing the situation for the good of, you know, whatever is prioritized as good. Um, and, you know, for us, there's so many ways. It's to be healthy. It's to have that wealth, that wealth of your own existence. And um, so I, I, I love that word healing. It's so interesting. I hear it echoed a lot. Um, I was talking to Amina, and she was like, she was just going through a period of healing. And I really like that because it's like reorganizing the life, um, your life. And what does that really mean? I think sometimes, I was thinking about this earlier today too. Like one of the things that I think um, learning to encounter your problems really teaches you is that um, you need to understand how your expectations of who, oh, I was going to write a poem earlier today, your expectations of yourself are different from what's gonna happen, like manifest over time. So you encounter the reality, this problem, not only do you have to fix the problem to whatever degree you can, but you also have to like change yourself. And so we're constantly going through that. And I was gonna write this poem that I was like, when I was five years old, you know, I thought I was gonna be like, I don't know, something like outlandish, like, um, 
I don't know, like a superhero of some kind. Right? And then when I was six years, and then like when I was six years old, and then just going down and down to the outlandishness. And then like five weeks ago, you know, I thought I was gonna be this, and then how I changed it, and just realizing that at every single point we constantly are changing and reorganizing our own expectations of ourselves, you know, and it's not really downgrading, but it is a fulfillment. Like your your desire to be this great whatever thing, it gets fulfilled in the way that you actually turn into um, whatever version of that, like that thing um, for yourself. So it's like you might not become Superman, but you also might get to a point where you your real interests, your real skills for me are poetry. And um, I don't know what the other thing is, community management or something like that. But um, you use those two things, you fulfill those to the max, and then you have poems that help people, that save them from situations. You are able to create an organizational structure that saves people from situations. So reorganizing that in your head and just what storytelling does, that ability to allow yourself to reorganize um, things towards the good of your life, because sometimes your expectations of yourself And block you from understanding what your real life is supposed to be. You know, like anxiety. What is anxiety? Sometimes I, I look at it and like, I'm like, you can be anxious. But I'm, not, I'm not trying to do that. That you're not right now. But <laughs> like you can be angry, but it's like everything's going to play out the way it's going to play out. That's what I always try to tell myself right now. Anytime I feel like freaking out, I'm like, Honestly, you're better off just going to sleep for the next six hours. Quit everything you thought you were going to do. If you're on the sidewalk, uh, you better find some nice cardboard, put it over yourself, take a nap, sir. Because obviously there's something going on with how you're perceiving reality. So you need to wake up and address whatever authority can help you out, whether it's like your own pride. Anyway, I'm going to go off on a tangent about a lot of stuff. But yes, I definitely think that writing is super duper healing, and I, I want to, you said it in a certain kind of way that I want people to take away from this. I don't know if you can jump back to it. Let's put you on the spot. Co uh, really, really um, distill the essence of what you had said about healing, if you could. What was that? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I have an impression of that he, was needed. Yeah. <laughs> Used to it. Hot to chop. Um, no, I was just just bringing back to, that. back to that point, right, shining light just on the fact that as writers, mm -hmm. even though we do through our writing mm -hmm. or through our art in general, if you're creative, through whatever you create, mm -hmm. uh, you've been given the power, the ability to heal others around you through what you create, mm -hmm. but it is never to be compared or even... Um, it's never to replace the fact that your writing or whatever you you're creating was meant to heal you. There is an audience of one, and that is you. And and there's somebody who needs to be healed. And I know, at least personally, there's so many times where I'm like, oh, you know, I want to impact this group of group of people, or you know, this type of society, and all you know, the audience, the audience. And I have to remember. This it's for me. Yeah. These writings, this this these songs, these songs, you know, uh, these ideas, they are to bring healing to my own life. And I believe that God is the one who has given us that gift and that ability, that power, mm -hmm. to not just you know heal others, but to bring that healing to ourself first. Because uh, I don't know which one of you used the um, example of like a hospital or a doctor. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Kevin, um, how can a doctor effectively heal their patients if they are hemorrhaging inside? Yeah. They can, but not for long. And that is that you know we that is a mindset you know where it's like as writers, even though we're gonna impact and bring relatability or, or healing or something to other people, we cannot forget that what you have produced is also supposed to be consumed by yourself first as well. And so, um, yeah. <laughs> no, that's, was that good? That was, 
that was super cool. And I think that's one reason why, I like, when we were going to call it Holiday Writers Commission, I was like, that still makes so much sense. Because in a lot of ways, we all are writers. You know, no matter what, you're creating the story of your life. And one of the biggest things that I encounter now, and I'm like, um, uh, like, realizing that people are maybe having a struggle in one area, uh, I'll find that usually it comes back to their ability to storytell. You know, and that's why things like the law of attraction or like, or even some of the other things that people do that like, um, like a lot of spiritual stuff is really about storytelling. It's like, how do I place myself in the story of my own destiny? And um, on, on a very small scale, Say it again. Oh, how, do, how, I... how do I place myself in the story of my own destiny? Somebody. That's you can good. get that and more uh, when you search Kenyo Poetry Books at your local Google. But what was I going to say? But can I place myself in a story of my own That's good. Where was, I, where was I going after that? No idea. Great. Good job. But it was good. <laughs> Someone needed to hear that again. That's true. That was out there for someone. But I think. I was going somewhere where we're Everything all writers. Everything's a story. We're all doing the story. It's gone. I'm just gonna have to assume that it wasn't that big of a deal. But we all are, uh, you know, writers, and we all are um, taking part in that. So I think it's super great for like the idea of celebrating HWC Holiday Writers Convention, and just the idea of writers is really to give everyone that ability to connect back to that part of themselves and really know how to storytell. And media is really fun, and I think as kids that really helps, um, and it's good for you to get healthy at it young, I mean get good at <laughs> it young in order for you to be able to be like a healthy, um, and have that healthy mentality. And I was gonna say that, as far as that whole place yourself in, in, in your own destiny, or whatever your destiny is, I think I was going in a place where you know, like, it's pessimism is a certain kind of storytelling, and, you know, anxiety is a certain kind of storytelling, and it's like telling yourself those kinds of stories, and some people get really good at it, like, and that's like a story that you're telling, and, you know, sometimes it's just like, I'm going to go back to it again, and don't think that I don't understand or I don't have sympathy um, for people with anxiety, it's more about how I think the problem should be solved, like, um, it's... You, if you encounter a problem, but you don't have the ability to first story tell a situation where this thing doesn't kill you, then you're going to be deathly afraid. You know, right? you'll you'll be as afraid as if someone was going to stab you, when it really isn't that dire. Um, and even if it might be, I think knowing how important that is to you at that point, let's say you were going to lose all of these things, and you want to know that ahead of time. So that you can really even have the ability to observe the timeline of your own decisions. Is that as good as the destiny comment? Observe the timeline <laughs> of your own decisions. Wow. Well, okay. Um, no. <laughs> it, was, it was good. It was good. But just to just to meet you at that, because uh, you do you keep bringing up anxiety, mm -hmm. and as someone who does have anxiety and right. does suffer from panic attacks, yeah. um, learning to express what you're feeling mm -hmm. is a lifeline like no other. Yeah. Because a lot of times, not saying that it's the, the cause of, of a panic attack or mm -hmm. just living with anxiety, like a beehive is mm -hmm. inside of you constantly, but you just still exist. Yeah. Um, Knowing how to express where you are, mm -hmm. how are you feeling to someone or even yourself, again, mm -hmm. it's about being able to talk to yourself, mm -hmm. writing to yeah. yourself, you know, um, that has brought healing in my life and I believe has the power to address, you know, things in such a way where not dis crediting medicine and, or, you know, therapy in any way. I love both. Um, but it does reach an intimate level in your own life 
in ways that I believe only you can. Because mm -hmm. there's places mm -hmm. in my mind yeah. that you can't go because yeah. you're not me. And I, I, I can't tell you how to. Mm -hmm. All I can do is know that I am existing mm -hmm. and I know that I can express, I've learned how to express what I'm feeling, why I'm feeling what I'm feeling. And because of that, mm -hmm. there has been healing, there's been freedom. I don't have to avoid a mic mm -hmm. <laughs> in my face <laughs> or things like this um, because of learning how to write, mm -hmm. learning how to express, learning how to use those tools that Again, they already know, I'm not even ashamed, I'm just crazy, um, that I believe God <laughs> you know, has given us mm -hmm. to you. So we're just all walking around not using the tools that mm -hmm. were put into place, wondering why the hell are we malfunctioning? Because yeah. we don't know how to use the tools that we've been given. Yeah. Boom. Okay. You know, that's um, interesting because it's like, you know, I, like this year, was the first year that I had a panic attack. You know, like it was legit. And it's one of those things where I, meditation helps me be present, you know? And when we talk about the stories that we tell ourselves, like we can, there's people and, you know, subconsciously we're moving at a rate that consciously we can't even understand. Like the majority of what we do is automated you know we just have that conscious choice to say like yes or no but being present allows you to cut you know those stories that are are that stories you know it's not to say that they're not real or fake but it forces you to be present because the story is either talking about something that happened or something that is to happen. And when you're in both of those, that's where a high level anxiety is because you're literally trying to go against the current of the unknown and you just are going to get knocked down. And that's where a lot of like my anxiety is because I'm just all like, okay, like this is what I want to happen or this is what did happen. And you know, that's why like the book, like The Four Agreements is like so amazing because it talks about these constant agreements that we sign off and we agree to and we have this judge within ourselves and this victim within ourselves, you know, that's constantly this back and forth. And I think that those stories, when you are not present, that's when those stories get to come alive and thrive. And those are the things that causes us to, you know, dive into this darkness. But the cool thing about writing is that, you know, the, the light is in the dark. You know, it's just like realizing that, you know, the knowledge is in the darkness, you know, and being able to go through that darkness of your soul and be able to go through and tell your story no matter what while being present. You know, like we're so not present a lot of the time, you know, like when I really think about a time where I've been present, I can't complain it's impossible because it's all like presently, right now, I can breathe. Presently, right now, I can write. Presently, right now, I can speak. Presently, right now, you know, I'm able to not agree to anything that someone else projected on me, you know? Super cool. All right, I think we all got one good one, so I'm happy. Uh, I think we can end it. I wanted to say something. I don't remember what it is. Oh, um, writing, storytelling. It's good for you to get used to it from a young age. I know, Lauren, you do a lot of stuff with kids and stuff like that, right? Young adults, yeah. Young adults, yeah. So I'm uh, with, with my media company, Project Forward, which is how you guys are. Some of you are watching it. Some of you are watching it on Dab Troll. And then maybe Lauren shared it, so some of you guys... And then Facebook make really good technology, so did YouTube, so I'm not taking credit for all of it. Anyway, um, so I like to help distribute, you know, <laughs> content around ideas. And uh, my fiance, Danielle Victoria, super awesome. She's doing more and more media these days. Um, congrats to her. Um, good job. Um, but she, we, I, I've been thinking about doing a project for kids for a long time. So we want to do at least like one project just to be like a 
like a leaping off point. What we want to do is do um, kind of like a Disney Channel show, you know, but like a, a better version. That kind of um, <laughs> I don't I don't really know. It might not be better, but a version where basically we get like kids to be like producers and writers and like a couple actors, and we film some sort of um, Project for Kids show using kids because the whole point is to create media um, like in a more authentic organic way so that the people watching it can get a kind of glimpse of themselves I think what's interesting about poetry what I like about it because you said and like no one can get to those certain places in your mind and I feel like by and large that's true but I think why poets like put themselves through some so much stuff like I have this one line in a poem that's like my poetry saves minds at one hundred lives per hour, something like that. And it's like, I'll leap off any cliff for a better poem. And I think sometimes like, I realize, you know, that people are going through these weird, um, you know, there's just no direct line of sight because like the internal mind, while it's not entirely unique, the way that we've mapped it, like people, everyone has the mind, but the way that we've mapped it, it might not be straightforward. Like, hey, I need to go to like into this room inside your mind and say this thing. It can't, it's not that straightforward. Um, and, but I think poetry can catch people up. I, I think we're just at a place where our luxury has like really um, been distributed to the masses. You know, like I think in a lot of ways that king, not everyone, but a lot in a lot of ways kings and queens were the only ones to experience. You know, even the luxury of time to think about a lot of the things that we're thinking about. And I don't know how great of a job they did. Not very great, but. Um, we're at a, I mean, they did all right. We had great poets and stuff like that, and I think that helped heal um, civilizations and groups of people. Um, but in a lot of ways, we're at a new level of just realizing, oh, okay, in ourselves, and I think as millennials, it's happening to us, um, in the same time where it's happening to kind of like the world uh, us also because of age and maturity and then also the world just because of social media. Like I see kids, I think in some ways are more just mentally healthy because they interacted in some ways. In some ways they're not crazy, but because they interacted with social media at a young age, I feel like it kind of makes you have a sense of self. You work with a lot of kids, so no, this isn't true. That's why we need a project for kids tomorrow. Yeah. They need it. The social media is not... Uh, social media in general is not helping with kids mm -hmm. because they don't know how to use it effectively. Yeah. So if it was a tool that they knew how to navigate in a way that would be beneficial to themselves, mm -hmm. presently and in the future, um, it, it would be successful in that vein. But mm -hmm. right now, it's, the age group that I deal with and the demographic of students that I deal with, mm -hmm. no. It's, it's killing them, it's getting them suspended because the schools check that stuff. Mm -hmm. And they cyber bully each other mm -hmm. and they, they're they just watching videos. Like I remember when YouTube mm -hmm. first started becoming a big thing before ads, mm -hmm. before all the ads. And I would sometimes just mindlessly watch videos, like funny videos or humor mm -hmm. videos. Today, the way we would look at memes. Mm -hmm. So that's what they're doing on their phones. Yeah. You know, they're just wasting time. Mm -hmm. And if I knew yeah. then what I know now about time, I would have been doing more than just watching YouTube videos. So, yeah. yeah. I see what you're saying. I think one benefit of the way that they're wasting time or the way that we used to waste time is because we used to have to waste time based off of whatever was just going on, right? And they are kind of like that too. But, like, you know, I had to waste time on, like, Pokemon or by, like, you know, like, I don't know. I mean, I read a lot, but you can also waste time by, in, in these, like, either in popular media or popular video games, whereas, like, now, at least they have YouTube, they can at least get really good, they can at least waste time at watching something that they specifically like. I don't know how many of them are really doing that, though, but, like, getting deep into their interests, because that's actually profitable if, if you do it enough, like, people who are like making careers off of playing video games and stuff like that. It's like, hey, that, that's kind of cool. And at least that lets you, you know like where you rank. Like if you're playing video games for free, this guy's making money. Um, you know, I think that's kind of why hip hop is 
technically in some kinds of ways inspirational for people, even when it is just the most um, hedonistic in its own <laughs> form, like if it's just talking about money and girls, I think uh, in some ways it, it, it talks to people in a language that they understand. And, and then if you actually listen to the ones who are successful, even though they talk about all that stuff, which is like kind of the context of their world, they'll still say things that kind of put people up on game a little bit. But anyway, I think I'm just getting kind of in the woods. I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, what, 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 I think I do want to let Lauren go, because uh, I know you need to leave. And it's all right. You, yeah. Trade off. Yeah. 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 I texted you. I texted you a lot. I don't do media. Do you really? But you have a phone number. You don't text text no, 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 I only get letters. Only get letters. <laughs> so what's the best way for me to get in touch with you? The best way for you to get in touch with me is to text me today. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to her original text? I don't know. <laughs> she would be like, no. no. <laughs> okay, I need your number again then. That's uh, uh, area code. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, we can write right. it down. I know. Um, you can find me at my personal number at um, Nemia. Yeah. Okay. You can write it on something. Like yeah, so I got a card. I'll give it you. Yeah. On oh, that same card I text, no. that's the one that has the number one. that I text. It's new and approved. It's thicker. It's thicker. It doesn't have the same yeah. number on it. It's new and approved as well. Mm -hmm. um, you weren't here when I was talking about the. Uh, thank you. You were here when I, when I was uh, talking about the uh, anxiety levels, and um, I was talking to Kevin, you know, about being overwhelmed, and I, I made a little joke, but it was very real. I said, oh yeah, I read this every time I feel overwhelmed, which is um, every 20 minutes. And so, uh, I'm sorry. It's cool. But text me for real today, okay. and I'll get back with you today. Boom. There we go. Power of media. Boom. Power media. Power media. Which, by the way, I just want to say real quick, because we were talking about that, I don't know how well that like correlates with the writers mm -hmm. we were talking about earlier. Yeah. However, I do completely agree. I think that we are exposing our youth, our children, mm -hmm. a way too early age, or we're just not giving them the tools to correctly yeah. weather that, because they are being exposed to comparison. They, you know, they are being exposed to so many things that you know by the time they're our age. They're already getting like implanted with like comparison and fear and over sexualized fantasies that don't exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, you know, all different things. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. too early. It's too early. It's too it's, early, too much. Too much, I, too early. I think, I think, I gotta go. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me get you my card. Yeah. <laughs> I think one way that we're doing it differently, because I think in general, like, every, people were already doing that kind of thing, but I think in one way where it's different. Uh, sure, if you want to. I think, well, well, we'll keep going. Me and Amina, you're good, especially. Um, in, in, in one way where it's different, I think, is that we leave the kids super alone. I am you know, so like, sorry. I feel like. You text me, okay? I do what's connect. cool about pre social media is that the kids were, like, you got your parents, you have adults sprinkled around the world, but on social media, they can have their own playground. Like in the dark, like that's what makes Tumblr really scary for me in certain kinds of ways. Like if I had a teenager, I think we just need teachers and parents and like uncles and aunts to get more into social media and be right next to their kids. That's why, like, they might say, like, oh, it's weird when your parents get on Facebook, right? But I think it's also super beneficial for you to exist in a society that's not just other 12 year olds and 13 year olds and stuff like that. It's not the best, it's not the best way, you know? So in addition to learning just tools of social media, which in a way, um, it's the same thing as that conversation. We just thought it was different, you know? Like everyone got addicted to the idea, like, you, media is just very confusing. It's like the same reason people feel awkward in front of a camera. And they also feel like a camera itself makes them famous, so they might start acting bougie or like weird. I think in the same way, like social media can trick you, and then and then you feel like this feeling of shame when you're like, oh, maybe I was a little bit too into it or whatever. And you have to realize the truth that you know you're just like a regular person, and then having to dial stuff out, dial stuff back, <laughs> and uh, stop being like a weirdo because people will have like whole breakdowns on social media. Yeah. I'm just like, what are you? Yeah. Okay, if you want to. Yeah.
Yeah, it can be. Yeah, so to what you were saying about having some type of supervision mm -hmm. on the internet. One thing is, they started, I think, with being able to set parental settings mm -hmm. on your cell phones and things like that. Then nowadays, kids, they, they'll figure out the password really fast or whatever the case may be. So mm -hmm. they bypass that system. Yeah. So then it's, you have all of these security systems or Facebook security or whatever the case. So if somebody flags your post, um, there's this team that investigates or whatever. So some type of supervision, an app or something where it's just parents who volunteer or whatever to be kind of that community could do something like that. There's an opportunity there's an opportunity for educators mm -hmm. to have social media presence professionally yeah. because yes, some, I, I think so. some kind of get into it. But a lot of my students want to follow me. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I can't right now. Wait till yeah. you graduate from high school. <laughs> you know, just because yeah. I don't want there to be any kind of implications or whatever. Um, but I almost think that it should be mandatory. Like if you're on Facebook, and you're in a class, I think while you're on Facebook, if you're in a class, your Facebook should be tied to whatever class you're in. That could be, but I mean, like, you know, per people have personal accounts, and mm -hmm. then they have, you know, Well, yeah, the teacher accounts. should have a teacher account. Right. Just like, you know, yeah, so it should be a separate account that's, like, run by the school, but you should just be, it should be attached to it. And it's not mandatory, I don't know, I just think something like that needs to go on. Yeah, I think that would be a cool idea, but then there's so much red tape and legal implications that we have to watch for with all the laws and teachers yeah. feeling like it's okay to engage in some kind of relationship with their students. Yeah. But I mean, if my students could see consistently what I do outside of school, yeah. they're gonna, oh, Ms. Parham, you, you do this, you do that? Yeah. Or then they can see who I'm connected to. Yeah. So they can, oh, I wanna learn graffiti. Mm. Instead of scrolling through random memes and stuff all day. Yeah, yeah. They be like, oh, Miss Parham's following this person. They're following this person. Mm -hmm. So then they become interested in what we're doing. Yeah. So we can kind of monitor in that way and just kind of steer them yeah. in the in the right way. Yeah. But again, that's that's wishful thinking and I think some people are able to do that. They have like Facebook like a group page for their class or something like that. But mm -hmm. a teacher really takes a big risk. Yeah. By doing something like that. Yeah. I think it's also unfortunate that I think a lot of media personalities are realizing that role. You know, you, they they act super trappy, you know, until they get famous and then they're like, oh, you know, I want to be a good mentor to the kids and like I help them out, you know what I mean? That's why I try to tell them, yeah, you know, you know yeah, I'm Lil Beats. You know, I, I do what I do in the streets, but you can be better than <laughs> Yeah, but maybe we'll get lucky and more media, because I mean, those media people are those kinds of people, and they can steer kids in that direction. So maybe we'll get lucky, and media will move more and more in that direction. I kind of wonder what it would take, you know, for something like that to happen. You know, as by being in the hip hop community, it's very interesting the level of independence. Like, I look at hip hop like a. Uh, like a cage lion, you know, it originally didn't start off that way, you know, but we're getting to a point where um, the cage was imaginary, you know, the cage, you know, whether it was by record labels or anything else like that, real hustlers, so to speak, knew how to make money with music, you know, whether it was like, all right, you know, I'm going to be independent, I'm going to sell them out the trunk, you know, Chameleon Air Paul Wall. You know, Ludacris before he repackaged his first album. You know, um, and he originally started off selling it straight out the back, you know. And so I think that where we're going with independent music as far as that reach, you're seeing more organic people that are getting on the microphone and that are getting their music out. And now there's no 
person saying like this can't go out to the masses because we have the internet so people are making their own decisions so yeah there's going to be a little bit more reach and more financial income when it comes to someone that's on the radio you know but someone that's independent can get on the radio as well and they don't have to quote unquote sell out but you know the independent route that we're going is remnants of like what we've always had as a people you know like we've always you know just saw like you, the way that i look at it is like as writers as people who are that do have influence because that's the one thing that a lot of people you know will tell the artists like you should be saying this because you do have influence you know and i'm up and down with that because it's just like at the end of the day I, I personally want authenticity, right. you know? So if that's you, you know, we go through, we're complex, you know? There's like a small little ratchet side of me, you know? But, and, and who makes music for that little part of me? I don't wanna ignore that. But what parents and what we as leaders, you know, that say we're leaders, that actually want to step into that mantle, I'm not gonna force anyone who doesn't want to be, you know, take that on. But if you say that's what you want to do, then you're able to direct and give that information of like, look, like this is exactly what I went through, and you just have a choice with as much music as what as as much music is coming out at this point, and the fact that everyone can, it you know, we're in a really interesting place where, like I was saying earlier, when it comes to writing, even writing in the music, um, things are gonna be switched, you know? Hip hop went from nothing to the highest paid genre in the world. You know, it's the newest genre, <laughs> you know, as far as, you know, what people would say, but it surpassed in this short period of time. So, you know, I think parents, people like us, need to get to a point where we can teach kids that what you're listening to, you know, you don't take serious. You know, as far as like if someone's sitting there, you have to be able to learn how to detach and they don't know it from off the back, but parents, some parents think that their kids do. Like they, you're barely learning social media so you don't have anything in place that filter, you know, like how your kids navigating through social media, what it is, like I was saying earlier, when it comes to, you know, like Warren was saying, when it came to judgment and things like that, you know, you're, we're in a time frame where, you know, that's not a class, you know, in school, like social media, it should be, you know, like it, because even for adults, like even in college, like these kids, you know, at that particular young age, they're impressionable. That's mainly the issue with parents, you know, getting upset that their parents, that their kids are listening to a particular thing is because they're impressionable, but you don't have anything in place to balance it out. Wow, you said three things that really have my mind going. Um, I think the first was, um, this division between independent artists and what they bring to the table versus a more mainstream artist. And when people say sell out, I think in, in my imagination, I would assume that's more of like, you know, not necessarily pledging some oath and all these things of the conspiracies, but not being able to read the contract that you're signing is selling out because you put yourself in a position where you will be beholden to another person. Mm -hmm. And you basically trade your image and your name and you lose control over that for mm -hmm. nothing in, in the long run. So teaching students, for me, or teaching young people is like contracting. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing that's gonna separate you from somebody who can be independent, is when you're presenting your contract and they can revise and send it back to you versus them giving you their contract. It's mm. totally different. Mm. Um, so that's the first thing. And that's something that like with what we're doing, um, I really hope to bring that to the table. Mm -hmm. um, also, 
you said something about. Uh, I just want you to go deeper into it, but let me let you finish. This. Okay, okay. Um, parents not knowing what their kids are listening to and that kind of influence. A lot of the parents that I deal with, I don't want to say everybody is like this. They're, I see where the kids get it from, mm -hmm. you know? And they're just about our age, maybe a little bit younger, maybe a little bit older, but they trap in every day. Yeah, and yeah. they're in a club, and then you can't get a hold of them when it comes to their grades. But they want you to do everything, yeah. right? So then when you try to take a more influential, active role, now you're breaking some law, and the parents are all on you. But it's like, when I'm trying to get a hold of you, I can't. And so the children are going to learn what's in their environment mm -hmm. and what parents think is okay. So a lot of the music that the kids listen to is made for their parents, but they like it, so they listen to it too. But it's not necessarily for them. Mm -hmm. um, and you said that kids, they like the music, um, but not necessarily the content is what's best. And they know that. I figured, like, I did a lesson on this, and they, they have a category of prophetic, poetic rappers, and we made a category of trash rappers. Mm -hmm. And a lot of their favorite rappers are in the trash category. So they saw it. Mm -hmm. Why? Metaphors, literary mm -hmm. devices, all these things. Mm -hmm. What separates a poet and a writer and a lyricist from a making money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they'll even say, well, I don't like that person because he's a gangbanger or he's a this, or he's a that. Mm -hmm. And they'll still be like, but I like the music though. Why? Well, it gets me hyped up. Well, this can too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody asked me today in school, who's Nas? <laughs> Where's the camera? <laughs> <laughs> Who is Nas, miss? Okay? <laughs> I had to put them on game. We did a whole lesson on that. And then you said about the app or there being some infrastructure. Parents are also using social media as diaries and things like that. So they're not using it correctly either. Yeah. So I like what you said about there needs to be some kind of class. And right now we do a brief presentation on bullying and how you should not use the social media, and then we never cover it again, and kids completely continue doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They try to ban cell phones from being used in the classroom, but they don't teach, it's like rather than making something taboo, teach about it so there's some awareness mm -hmm. involved, because young kids have the capacity to know. Mm -hmm. It's us taking that lead and teaching them truth and not coddling them in a way. Um, but in public school, there's so much legal ramifications that you have to tread some kind of line. I think that in the more um, financially destitute areas and social economical situations, you're gonna see more of that versus if you go somewhere with a higher tax, <laughs> tax bracket, they might have those classes those social media classes. They might have all that stuff. So there's also that division between what we should not rely upon another entity to do for the communities that we live in. Mm. And that's that's what you said that made me like, oh. <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, you know, when I think about the fact that, um, you know, a lot of, we downplay you know, the capacity of kids. You know, they, when I think about how quick a kid can learn, mm -hmm. like the language, I'm, I'm just all like, I'm kind of jealous. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's just like when you're older, you're pushing against so much that a kid is just all like, oh, they don't have that, I don't, I wouldn't say feel, they haven't um, developed that fear is what I would say. Because kids, for the most part, are fearless. I think that they're taught fear. Um, 
you know, because you have the parents who, yes, they listen to that stuff, but they're not taking into consideration that, you know, we live in an age where you can control, like, what you listen to and when you can listen to it, you know? So it's just all like, okay, you like that, that's perfectly fine, you know, but do you have to play it around the kids? Like, you know, there's some parents who can, you know, keep a low key that they smoke from their kids, mm -hmm. but you can't like tame what you listen to. And your your particular reasoning for that is because I'm an adult, mm -hmm. and that confuses the kid. You know, and there's a lot of confusion when it comes to, you know, the kids because they see their parents doing this, and all they can think of is like I'm an adult, so that when they grow up. I can do as soon as they're 18 or whenever they personally feel, you know, they're adult, they're just like, well, I can do this because this is all I've been wanting to do because you've made, you've made this perception all my life that, you know, this is what adults can do. You, like, made that particular thing, but what that does is I think that it creates a form of laziness that just isn't talking because it allows for them to not go the extra mile because they didn't they weren't taught that discipline to be able to separate that they were even considered you know in the future like as far as all like you know you know I'm a kid you know that this potentially has the power to influence me so you're going to just allow it to keep on playing you're going to allow it to them to watch particular movies that just aren't their age. You're gonna allow them to have a cell phone that has these social media apps on them and not any type of filter, you know, so. Okay, um, I was gonna say to that, and then there's the flip side, to where if you are going to expose your children to that type of media, Contextualize it. Don't just let them listen to it and it's like, okay, keep going. Yeah. Like, sit down and have a conversation, break down the lyrics, look at the lyrics with them, you know, spend that time. That's, that's education. So, some students, I can only come at them with what they listen to. They won't do anything else. So, it's like, all right, let's break these lyrics down. Take this one and write the lyrics. They won't write a sentence for me in class, but if I tell them, write your favorite verse of this song. <laughs> you know, okay, cross out all the basic words. Yeah. Okay, what vocabulary do you have left? Do you know what this word means? No, and, and go from there. So even if we're not in a position where we can just shut everything down or, you know, keep certain things contained, contextualize it. And that becomes a vehicle to teach. Um, something else you said, something else you said. Mm -hmm. I don't really remember off the top of my head, but there was something else you said that was key. But I know you had something that you were going to say a little while back. Mm, I don't remember, but I am soaking up just it like... Something, <laughs> it, was something, it was something to the effect of like when we were talking about contracting. You had oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I did want you to go deeper into that concept about how you said it was like when you're working with kids, it's like contracting. Um... That reminds me of what you said. Okay, so what does it mean to be an adult? I can grow up and do whatever I want and do all the things my mama wouldn't let me do. And like you said, it, it makes this absent-mindedness of what to strive for as you become of age. So discipline, the ability to balance different life activities, how to take care of yourself when you're stressed out, how to recognize when you're stressed out. Being able to think critically and long term is what it means to be an adult, in my opinion. Rather than just turn up and do what I want, yeah. you know. Um, and again, society has a lot of milestones that don't really mean anything at a certain age. And contracting is something we should be teaching our youth from the beginning. Because are we raising these young people to be dependent upon us? or being mm -hmm. able to be independent. Yeah. So, I grew up, it doesn't matter what you think, 
It doesn't matter how you feel, you're going to do what I say. Yeah. Right? Research says to be firm, yeah. set boundaries, have discipline, mm -hmm. and leave room for dignity, and give that other human being, not just your child, this future businessman, this future businesswoman, an opportunity to communicate mm -hmm. and express their perception. Mm -hmm. So now you can see where they're coming from. Yeah. And to negotiate. Because I want you to be able to negotiate your job offer when you get older. Mm -hmm. So where are you going to learn how to do that but at home? I need to teach you how to do that. So with little stuff, they do it with little kids, you know. Um, you can pick this outfit or that outfit. I want this one. Mm -hmm. Now they've made a choice. They feel empowered. Mm -hmm. But you still set some kind of parameter for them. And contracting what I've studied is very similar to romantic sexual relationships. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our kids have no understanding of their body. They have absolutely no awareness of how to gauge it in a relationship with somebody else, whether it's romantic, platonic, business, whatever the case may be, and that's all contracted. So when you're talking about sexual intercourse, there's business intercourse. When you're talking about a contract and laying out all parameters and agreement. Businesses, I think about those different things and how one is a metaphor of the next, um, uh, those, those aspects inside of what makes a city livable. When you think about um, the residential areas and like you'd always have to in the game you always have to balance you know your residential they need jobs so you have to zone enough industrial and so if you zone industrial they need places to sell their things so you have to zone enough commercial um and then you know the people will go buy you need enough people then you have to it basically comes back around you have to zone enough residential to for people to live there to go buy the goods and then of course they need money, so you have to sell more resident industrial, and they have to be happy too. So in 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 balancing those things, you also have to build things like parks, right? Because the people won't be happy. Then you also have to build things like hospitals, access the health service, and they have to build police. And I think about that as like you know sometimes like understanding contracts and things like that, um, and and really just being able to talk about. I, I think that contracts and what why I think what you said about agreements too. Um, and I want to go back to the, the residential thing, but the, the thing about agreements too is like being able to talk about those things. I almost think that we wouldn't need contracts as much if we talked more. Actually, I could just leave it right there. But really, I think what's going on in business is there's a like talking time is such a commodity. So it's like I'm going to rewrite, pre write. That was the idea, I think. I'm going to pre write everything that we would talk about it. I mean, talk about because we don't really have time to be in the same place at the same time. Like it's like a meeting that's written down, like pre-document. We've already had this meeting. Here's the meeting, but it's like you don't really know if you just sign it. Then you're assuming that you were in that meeting, and every time they said something, you said yes. That's what you're doing when you sign it. But if you really read through it, then you're saying yes. Then you might call them and be like, hey, no on this. What would what, you have to say on this one? I could be wrong. No, no. Um, but I'm just gonna give what's in my head right now based on some things I've been learning and experience. I had an opportunity to meet this businessman and it's a Jewish guy. And his rule was, he built this huge business. Mm -hmm. His rule was, you don't make contracts with family. Mm -hmm. And in a way, extending a contract is telling somebody you don't trust them, mm. right? Um, and so, again, that contraceptive that you put out. That's interesting, right? yeah. Then there's the aspect of our people ran governments. We may not be running, we're not flying the, the airplane here, mm -hmm. but we used to. So if we can run a government, we should be able to contract independently for a workshop. Mm. Oh, yeah. You know? Mm. And that's what starts yeah. to create independence. And I think that prior to being colonized, whether it be by 
foreign entities or some of our own people, there wasn't that need to sign. Mm -hmm. It was oral. You did what, you're say, what you said you were going to do. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing we had was our word. And it was, it was real. Mm -hmm. I remember a scene from uh, Amistad where I forgot the actor's name, but it's an African guy. He says something to be translated. Um, no, no, the, the attorney, the European attorney says something to be translated to the guy. And he's something, he says something about, we're gonna try to win your case. And the guy stops, the translator stops. And he said, I can't translate that. He said, why? He said, there's no try in this language. You either do it or you don't. So that, that creates that, that mentality for me is, do I need to sign a contract? No, because I'm gonna do what I said I'm going to do. But some people have to put their signature so you can be beholden to it, mm -hmm. so you don't get ripped off, or you know, whatever the case may be, you can have remedy yeah. if, if something happens. And again, you come back to that agreement, if, especially if there's a lot of people involved, it's like, okay, 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 what did we say? before we started. Mm -hmm. And then I feel that transition from being oral and, and trusting each other with our word, our word mm -hmm. being our bond, coming into colonization and things, there had to be a way to steal land from people. Mm -hmm. There had to be a way to steal property. And it was all done through contracts. Mm -hmm. If I know you can't really read this, if I know you can't really understand this, and you're like, oh, okay. Our signature, our autograph is so powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, it's we're the grantors. Mm -hmm. And when we sign, we're giving that document life. Mm -hmm. You know, and so contracts have been our downfall in a way. Mm -hmm. And the only way I feel to move forward is to become literate in being able to produce those. Mm -hmm. and, and that comes with reading. Just yeah. reading comes in two parts. There's reading fluency, mm -hmm. and there's reading literacy. Mm -hmm. So I can be fluent, I can read the words, but that doesn't mean I'm comprehending what I'm, what I'm reading. Mm -hmm. So that whole aspect mm -hmm. of teaching kids young, I teach my students, if you have a problem with a teacher, don't pop off at them. Go to the district website, find the policy, find where it says student rights, Find out what your rights are, write a complaint. Because when you all get fussy with us, I never argue with my students. I'm not gonna argue with you because while you're yelling and screaming and sitting in ISS or being suspended, I have documentation. And that's how I don't have to say anything. I can just push that. And then that becomes the record, that becomes the, the court of record in a way. So teaching, from that age up how to contract. And there's so many, you can create whatever you want. It's almost like a business. Mm -hmm. Whatever you want, those terms, it allows people to be independent and to protect themselves mm -hmm. if they know how to use the weapon. Yeah. That's, there's so much there. Uh, I, I love thinking about, um, what you might call it, contracts and stuff like that, because I really think about them as being a metaphor for our relationships. Um, kind of like Amina said, uh, not just relationships, but also um, your estate and understanding yourself and understanding the place that you live in. I think that's where contracts really come from. Um, and then I think a little bit, uh, what's misunderstood to people is that their estate is so varied. It's not just that you live on um, like a certain place, because apartments become a part of your estate when you're leasing them. And now, uh, that the reason why it's leased, and that's why like I love this thing, like time estate. Just think about what time estate is. I think of that as a metaphor for leasing, because it's it's literally an estate with a time limit on it. You know, like you own it for this amount of time. You can do it anyone who owns anything within, there's obviously a bunch of different parameters and even with your own house, there's a bunch of stuff that you can't really do because we don't really, you don't really own a piece of land, even though you call that real estate. You know, like 
your government, one, by being a citizen, you were born into this thing, they have eminent domain. If they want, they can take your land and give you money for it. Um, there's certain things that you can't do if you're in an HOA uh, with your stuff. They might tell you how to keep your house and tell you what to do with your house and stuff like that. So really, even though you technically have like a never-ending, it's, it's kind of like, yeah, but never-ending lease or something like that. Who are you leasing these things from? But And then I think that's why people sometimes come up with the idea is like, oh, we're fighting against the man, but there's no man. You're essentially, I mean, there is man, there's us, our civilization. So we're making these rules because not only do we want to have a stable civilization, but we want to have a, a civilization that can progress. And based off of our um, knowledge right now, we make, um, we make, we lease almost, we, we buy, we lease, we cooperate, we make these rules, we make uh, rules for people's estates um, inside of this collective progressive future. Um, and there's so many different kinds of estate, I think. And I think art is one way of just getting your identity out there and having that be a lasting piece of space in a certain area. Um, anyway, I think even though we're waiting for a meeting to get back, I think we're, we gotta, we'll, we'll, we'll end this. This is a long, I, could, I feel like this could never end, but I think what me, we're gonna do is me and Amina and Kevin, we'll just talk without the camera a little bit as much as we want to. Let me see what's going on over here. Someone said, Mondrea Harriman said hello. What's Mondrea, up? what's up? What up, Mondrea? What up? What up? Um, we know him. Most people know him. You guys probably know him in some shape or form. But um, let me... Departing. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to end this stream. You guys can't see me right now. Thank you guys for watching this. HWC 2018. Uh, whenever you're watching this, Shout out to you. Go over and head over to projectforward.tv. Um, head over to Amina, type in Amina Deshay in Google. Uh, if you're watching this in the year 2029, um, you can visit the virtual Amina Deshay Island uh, via Mind Shuttle. Um, <laughs> you just type in Amina with your eyeballs. Anyway, and then. <laughs> Kevin Prince, <laughs> Miss AK, Mr. Composition, um, Dab Troll. Troll, you can find him, yeah. He also probably is the, uh, I was trying to find another site by metaphor. He runs the, um, gives power to the, uh, I can't think of anything. Yeah. I was going to say, like, in the future, everyone has some sort of, like, built-in media thing in their house. And it's like, oh, let me call Dab Troll to fix this. It's like a... <laughs> Thing, and then Dab Troll comes and you're like, oh great, I can make paintings again or something like that. Hey, it's anyway. a big customer <laughs> service, like, hey. Brands of the future, Bow. this is the yeah. beginning. See you guys later. Peace. I'm booked, I'm booked. Send a text to my phone. Saying, can you are your own? Need you to work the show. Need words that glow. I'm booked. I'm booked. I'm booked. I'm booked.